On the show this afternoon, uh, special guest, we have Alan Weinrib, the producer on the new Rush documentary, Time Standstill, which is in theaters for one special night only, coming up on November 3rd at Silver City, London. Thanks for being on the show, Alan. My pleasure. It's one thing to produce a film. It's another thing to grow up with Getty Lee. So you provide a, a very unique and special look at 40 years of this incredible band. Uh, yeah, I would say so. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you start with a project of this magnitude? Well, I mean, the film really started with the, the the whole concept of the tour because uh, as the tour began there was already you know questions of you know whether or not it would be you know the last major tour of its kind for the band so you know no this, this documentary unlike you know the previous one that was done on the band isn't really a historical look at them you know we really kind of focused on on what would this what would a tour like this be like if, if you knew it was the last time around and 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 nobody did know that at the beginning. So so to us that was you know an opportunity to to you know to explore and investigate. So you know the first thing we did was just kind of work it work it out with the band that we could have a cameraman on the tour with them throughout you know the the 35 cities that they were traveling to. Uh, Dale Heslip, the director of of this particular doc, is also our creative director on the tour. So. You know, our our roles begin, you know, months before the tour began. Like the tour, I think, started in April. But, you know, we were already working on things creative that goes along with the Rush tour. If you ever see Rush live, it's, you know, the the, the films that run behind them play as integral a role as, as the music themselves. You know, you're bringing me back to a show. Uh, I caught them live in Sarnia a couple of years ago. And I remember they had this opening sequence when it takes the guys back to Willowdale where they were growing up. and so they had Them as a polka band, exactly. Yeah! So that, yeah, you know, th- at that point in time, the, that, the first doc done on them had come out and, you know, kind of told their history. So, the, you know, we sat with the band and we're trying to think, oh, how do we frame this tour because it was an anniversary tour at the same time and that's where we came up with the whole concept of doing a bunch of short clips called the in quotes real history of rush so so we'd been talking to the band for months working with them already and you know as it got closer to actually being a tour you know we we were well underway so we would see them in many cities because we also then so we worked with the band before the tour begins to do (laughs) to do their stage design and creative elements around it but then we also, you know, act as the production company to film the live show. So R40 Live was, again, directed by Dale and produced by myself. Talking to guys like Chad Smith from Chili Peppers, Gene Simmons from Kiss, Taylor Hawkins from The Foos, uh, Anne and Nancy Wilson. What do you think every single artist that I just named uh, in that 20-minute extra that's going to appear in theaters, what do you think they they all have in common in something they would say about the band Rush? I think they would, they'd all talk about their dedication to the music, you know, their virtuosity at each one of their instruments. I think that's, that's always what you walk away from this band, is, you know, just the integrity they bring to what they do on a daily basis. You know, they, they care so much about how they perform and the way in which their music is received by their fans. That is a, an in-theater only. So if fans want to see that clip, they got to buy tickets to the theater. And there's something to be said in this documentary. I've watched the trailer um, about the the very weird and loyal fan base that has followed this band all these years. Whether you have met this fan yourself or, or just observed them from afar, who is the most loyal Rush fan that you've come across? Well, you know, well, I, you know, there there is one gentleman in particular who, you know, I know that he's he himself has seen over I think last number was like least well over 350 shows. Oh I my know. goodness. You know, he he you know, did everything he could to go see them the first time in Japan and he been you know to many stops in Europe and when when I worked with the band and we were doing Russian Rio um, I remember, you know, I had, they were playing Rio uh, a night after they were doing Sao Paulo. So I went to the Sao Paulo show just to get a sense of what a Brazilian crowd is like in a, in, in a large environment. And I remember very clearly uh, as, the, as we entered the arena or the, the stadium, I should say, we, you know, it's kind of a crazy environment down in Brazil. So it was literally the first time I'd ever been a part of a, a police escort. So we right. literally had motorcycles and police cars getting us to the venue. You know, kidnappings are a big thing. And, you know, they just make sure you've got to get in. I remember getting in there thinking, wow, it was just crazy. And as the door was closing, I remember looking out and seeing that same gentleman 
standing outside. <laughs> I thought, oh my god, he's here in Brazil. Even it was it was a little haunting almost, but yeah, but yeah, no, there's. I mean, the documentary, you know, definitely, you know, focuses on that relationship and and what this band means to their fans, and 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 conversely, what the fans have meant to the band all the way along, because. You know, when we sit down at the beginning of every tour and we start, you know, even jamming about what kind of ideas can we do, you know, it always comes back to, yeah, the fans, the fans will love that. They would love if we did something like that. That's kind of how we very slowly nudge the band into actually becoming actors because at the end of the day, you know, we at different times we had Jerry Stiller on and we had other people, but the fans, we knew they loved seeing the guys. Seeing the guys and having them play these roles and being themselves was, was always a big hit. Now tell me why you chose Paul Rudd to be the narrator on this documentary. <laughs> well, you know, it's more again, he's a fan. He's a, he's a big fan. The, the, the narration is is fairly minimal. You know, really the the band themselves tell the story and and the fans that we speak to help carry you through this doc and tell you what's going on. So, you know, we wanted someone who had acting ability, someone who has a great voice and someone who could you know, bring life to the the very few words that we did put in there. And and Paul, being a fan, just seemed like a natural choice. Cool. So very fortunate to get him. And then uh, another big part of the documentary is behind the scenes on this last tour. So, you know, you get get your intro into Alex's The Bag character. Uh, (laughs) What what other behind the scenes moments, uh, you know, really really sell the longevity of Rush for you? You know, the band talks about the, the early touring life, you know, which kind of leads up to that, yes, the, the kiss story and the bag story, but you know we're 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 talking to you know a number of their you know their their crew members and you know we get to be a part of the sound check in L.A. and and you know and we're back there when the when the show's over you know so it's it's about access you know and about pulling the curtain back and seeing you know what's going on back there for this very private band that everyone wonders about right. <laughs> Yes, mm-hmm. very much so. Uh, what's uh, your favorite behind-the-scenes moment in the film? Although the lighting guy talking about the bag character was classic. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's very hard. I, I think I have a hard time saying what would be my favorite back scene. I mean, to me, you know, everything that happens in L.A. is pretty unique. And certainly when one of the fans asks, you know, Jillian, who's one of the individuals that we kind of focused on, she wonders what it would be like for the band at that point in time. You know, you're about to go and do a show that after 40 years, what it would be like. And then we go backstage to see what's going on. That, that I'm not going to give it away, but that, okay. that might be, that to me, that's, that's a pretty good moment. And I imagine that it was a pretty emotional uh, 40th anniversary tour for you as well as your brother. Yeah, no, it was. There were definitely moments where, you know, certainly when they did the, the shows in Toronto, you know, there were moments where I'm looking around going, yeah, this could be, I, you know, I've spent so many years seeing them play, you know, first Maple Leaf Gardens and then the ACC and, you know, the SARS concert here in Toronto, like all these gigantic venues in Toronto. So to think of that moment and realize, like, this actually may be the last time they're going to be playing the ACC. Yeah, yeah, you find yourself getting a little misty-eyed, a little choked up. And the doc actually has a good moment because we, we look at that Toronto show because it the band, you know, it really was a peak for them on this particular tour as well. So When do you remember Getty telling you about his band, this band that you would go on to work with on more than one documentary and now finally this big time capsule project that, you know, we call Rush Standstill? Well, I mean, you know, I was really just a little pisher when the whole thing started. So there was there was no telling. I mean, it was happening because they were rehearsing in our basement and, you know, interrupting my TV watching because they were so loud <laughs> <laughs> and obnoxious at that point in time. They were, they were more of an annoyance than anything else because they were in my way. One of my favorite memories was that they used to be, you know, Getty would get a phone call and I hated going into the basement while they were playing this loud music. So I would flash the lights on and off to let him to try and get his attention and tell him that someone was phoning him and at one point they actually then asked me to come downstairs and, and hold these floodlights and, and and whirl them around because they wanted to see if they could play in the dark so I, I was kind of their first lighting designer i've read somewhere about how getty got his nickname from it was it grandma oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I know it was our grandmother. Yes, with her Yiddish accent. Getty, what are you doing? Getty, what are you doing? <laughs> that must have been yeah, embarrassing absolutely. when they were in the basement with the guys, eh? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, totally. That, there's a whole other story about my Because my grandmother used to cook down there while they were rehearsing all the what? time. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like making matzo ball soup? <laughs> totally. Yeah, That's absolutely. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. so cool. If it's okay with you, I would love to chat about uh, some of your other work with your production company. A lot of it's in and rock and roll. Oh, yeah, sure. When did you know that you wanted to get into production uh, and specifically looking a lot at, at music? You know, I really go back to the early days of music videos. I, I spent, you know, before I even got into any of this sort of long form programming, I was doing music videos going way back when. The, I mean, the very first video I think I ever produced was a parachute club dancing at the feet of the moon, <laughs> uh, working with Deborah Samuel. And yeah, 17 years, you know, I kind of at one point sort of you know, deemed myself the grandfather of music video because <laughs> there was very few artists at the time that had flowed through this country that I didn't work with at one point in time, either as a, directly as a producer or as an executive producer on the project. I mean, that's where it all began. You know, back then before we had PBRs and, and VCRs, you actually had to, you know, be there at 7.30 and, on a <laughs> Sunday night to see what the newest music videos were. So, Did you decide that you wanted uh, to do this kind of thing for a living before or after older brother uh, decided he wanted to be in a band he was already in the band so i was i was already on my own trying to strike out you know in my my own signature way so i was really getting more into television and you know started my career doing commercials and yeah. that's kind of how the parachute club then dropped in my lap and and at that point it seemed like yeah the perfect kind of marriage my love of music and, and love of television were able to be combined into one thing you know you've been all over the place too with um, the Tragically Hip this summer I think when people are talking about live memories of the Tragically Hip so many times they bring up that night in Toronto and you were behind that project too I was I was pretty sure on that one as well yes it was a pretty special night it was great with getting an opportunity to work with Gordon the guys you know we've done a couple of music videos with them in the past so there was a bit of a relationship there and and I had a relationship with Pierre Lamoureux, who had done, uh, who had been the director on uh, the R30, and uh, I believe the Snakes and Arrows live DVD with Rush. So it was, it was, it was great to be able to work with him and work with, yeah, great, another great iconic band, and create a great memory out of that night. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, yeah. and looking no forward to seeing uh, your documentary and all your hard work come together. Great, thanks very much.